The following program is paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. And hello, church family. It feels great to be with you. Thank you for rolling out of bed today on this overcast morning. We love having you here. We love you. You know, there is a quote that doubt kills more dreams than failure ever will. So today, in the name of Jesus, may your life always be led by faith and not fear and doubt. Turn around and shake the hand of the person next to you or give a high five and say, God loves you and so do I. We just want you to know that you're loved and I always believe that when people come to church, they already feel guilty enough, beat up enough, tired enough. We always wanna create an environment where you can leave here full of joy. Encouragement's a spiritual gift. It's one that I possess, and uh, we want, to, want you to be encouraged. We want you to leave here excited today. And one of the things I'm really excited about is that we have Ed Stetzer here. He's going to be preaching oh. for us this morning. He's uh, one of my favorite preachers. If you're not familiar with, with Ed, he's an interim pastor at Moody Church, and he's the chair of the Billy Graham Center. So it's, it's going to be a great morning, and lots of other exciting things happening today. But, you know, nobody makes a bigger impact in our lives than the Holy Spirit. There's just something about receiving a touch from God that no matter what we're going through, it can carry us through any storm, any fire. So we're just gonna come and believe that the Holy Spirit is here with us, that he's overjoyed, uh, that he is the most joyful being in the universe and that to be with him is a joyful experience. And so Lord, we just thank you that you're here. We pray in Jesus' name that you'd forgive us of our sins, that you'd renew us and free us, Father, from all the, the habits and choices that harm us and others and help us, Lord, to walk in holiness and to be more like you, Lord, and to love our neighbor with compassion and understanding, that we'd be slow to anger and, and quick to mercy. And Father, we thank you that today we're gonna be encouraged by your word and by your scriptures. And thank you, Lord, that you love us um, today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Hannah and I are so happy you've joined us in worship today. We hope that you've found incredible hope and inspiration from our program. Here at Shepherd's Grove and Hour of Power, we truly believe that we are better together. Regardless of where on this earth God has planted us, in Him we are a family. Bobby and I want you to know that we are so grateful for your generosity to our ministry. But it's not just our ministry, it's your ministry. And none of this would be possible without you. Because of you, People all around the world are being reached with the gospel every single week, and their lives are being changed forever. As we enter into another year of His goodness, we pray that you also know that you are part of God's family. You are a beloved child of God, united by His Spirit with brothers and sisters in every nation of the world. That's right, we want you to know that you're never alone, no matter what you're facing. God has the whole world in His hands. He loves you, and so do we. Today, Bobby and Hannah would love to send you this 2019 Hope Around the World wall calendar. Each month features a beautiful photo from the United States or a country where an Hour of Power office is located, like Canada, Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, the Netherlands, and Germany. Your calendar also includes monthly scriptures and inspiration, as well as powerful testimonies from members of both our national and international Hour of Power family. 
large boxes for each day of the month, perfect for writing in appointments and events, or the names of loved ones you want to pray for. Each day also includes a daily scripture reading to help you read through the Bible in one year. We want this 12-month calendar to remind you of how truly loved you are and how much we honor your partnership with this ministry. Call, write, or go online today and request your 2019 Hope Around the World wall calendar or asking for a generous gift of any size. Thank you for watching the Hour of Power and for your ongoing generous support to help keep this program on the air. Now, let's return to the service. may be seated. In preparation for today's message, the words of our Lord found in 2 Corinthians 5.16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. Church family, we are adjusting our lenses so we may see others as Jesus sees them. Amen.
What a joy uh, to have you here this morning. Thank you uh, so much. Now, for those of you who have been praying for the reincarnation of uh, Elvis or Hank Williams, it's finally happened. <laughs> Just to clarify, we don't believe in reincarnation here. <laughs> no, but hey, actually, you're a believer, aren't you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sh Sean Olio, thank you. I mean, he, Sean is a talented, well, and how old are you, by the way? 16 years old. Sean was named uh, one of Orange County's top influencers. He's also now a part of this new generation of Disney's Mouseketeers. Yes, sir. So you're a part of that project as well. Yeah, I know. It's been a blast. I'm sure my daughter's going to be a huge fan. <laughs> Uh, and I, I will be too. So tell me a little bit about, I mean, music is great. You clearly have been influenced by some of those guys, Jerry Lee Lewis, Hank Williams, yeah, Johnny sure. Cash, right? Yeah, no, definitely. I think uh, it just stems from hours and hours of listening to, uh, to country music with my grandpa growing up. And uh, you know what, but I think a lot of that just kind of finds itself in, in worship music. And I think, you know, everything can lead back to, you know, to us here today and, and so. It's been an absolute blessing. Uh, tell me about that. So you, you play in your church, and you do things, I guess it's been an important part of how you even developed your own musical career. And No, definitely. I, I do, uh, I'm the cantor at our, at our mass for, for our church services, and, uh, you know, I think there's, there's a special connection that, that, that music brings to, to our worship, and, and, you know, I think uh, it's just it's a blessing to be able to do that, do what you love, and also, you know, have that deeper meaning in everything that you do. That's great. It must be nice being here with your brothers, your two brothers. Yeah, no, I got a... <laughs> you guys yeah. look related. You're not related, huh? No, no, no just relations. Friends. Just just really good friends. But we got Nathan Reyes on the cajon, everybody, and uh, Sebastian Mendoza on bass over there. Great. Sean Olio, thank you so much. Thank you we so much for having me. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Remind me to get a selfie with you before you leave so I can <laughs> okay. say I knew him before he was... Well, sure I guess you're already you. famous. Thank you, sir. Thank appreciate you so much. You. Really bless. appreciate it. Thank you.
Awesome. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we are overjoyed that we have the opportunity to gather here and just declare your goodness, declare who you are, and praise your name. And Lord, we are thankful for that. Lord, we pray for all of those who have been affected by Hurricane Michael, and we, we just pray that your Holy Spirit invade that area and that your church invade that area as people are entering back into their communities, not sure of what they're going to see and the devastation that we've seen on TV. We pray that your church can physically be your hands and feet in that place uh, right now. Lord, we are delighted by the fact that we were created for community and that as we are here, we rejoice with one another. We hold one another up. And Lord, we pray for deeper and more uh, thoughtful and just we pray that people connect. And Lord, and that as we connect with one another, we connect with you. Lord, we lift up Ed to you this morning and we pray that the message that you have put on his heart, that we have open ears and open minds and open hearts to hear what it is that you have given him to say. Lord, we pray for this offering which we are about to receive. And Lord, we, we pray that it be uh, multiplied many fold for your kingdom and your kingdom activity. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it's a delight each and every week to gather here and to worship God. And one of the ways we worship is through giving. We, we thank God for what he has given us. And in turn, we give a portion back to what he is doing all around this world and the incredible mission that his church is having in this world. And so with that in mind, I'd like to invite the ushers forward as we prepare to receive this morning's tithes and offerings.
Hannah and I are so happy you've joined us in worship today. We hope that you've found incredible hope and inspiration from our program. Here at Shepherd's Grove and Hour of Power, we truly believe that we are better together. Regardless of where on this earth God has planted us, in Him we are a family. Bobby and I want you to know that we are so grateful for your generosity to our ministry. But it's not just our ministry, it's your ministry. And none of this would be possible without you. Because of you, people all around the world are being reached with the gospel every single week, and their lives are being changed forever. As we enter into another year of His goodness, we pray that you also know that you are part of God's family. You are a beloved child of God, united by His Spirit with brothers and sisters in every nation of the world. That's right. We want you to know that you're never alone, no matter what you're facing. God has the whole world in His hands. He loves you, and so do we. Today, Bobby and Hannah would love to send you this 2019 Hope Around the World wall calendar. Each month features a beautiful photo from the United States or a country where an Hour of Power office is located, like Canada, Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, the Netherlands, and Germany. Your calendar also includes monthly scriptures and inspiration, as well as powerful testimonies from members of both our national and international Hour of Power family. Large boxes for each day of the month, perfect for writing in appointments and events, or the names of loved ones you want to pray for. Each day also includes a daily scripture reading to help you read through the Bible in one year. We want this 12-month calendar to remind you how truly loved you are and how much we honor your partnership with this ministry. Call, write, or go online today and request your 2019 Hope Around the World wall calendar or asking for a generous gift of any size. Thank you for watching the Hour of Power and for your ongoing generous support to help keep this program on the air. Now, let's return to the service. Well, what a joy today to have Ed Stetzer with us. Ed is uh, really a pastor that I think of as someone who's cross-denominationally connected. Would you say that's true? Yeah, Ed? I like to be. Yep. Ed uh, is a regular contributor for Christianity Today and is the interim pastor at, I think you said it was the oldest megachurch in the oldest America. extant megachurch, still existing megachurch in the yeah, country, in the world, actually, in the world. 100 years, 150 years church old. Moody in church in Chicago. Yeah. And he's flown all the way out here to preach to our church today and to preach to the Hour of Power on a subject that I think troubles a lot of us. And that is the, the divisiveness, the outrage, the, the contempt that's happening between people who disagree, particularly politically, but also within our own faith and how we engage civilly with one another in our disagreements. And uh, so we're gonna, he's gonna preach on that today, but would you welcome with me Ed Stetzer. Thank Hi, you so Ed. much. Good to be here. And so we got to even just chat a little last night over dinner and we talked about some of these things, but this book is awesome. Christians in an Age of Outrage, it's, it's really needed. It just came out this week. And uh, tell me a little bit about um, why you wrote this book and why we need it today. Well, it seems like a lot of Christians are maybe sometimes falling into the pattern of the world, being more kind of focused on joining in the outrage than showing a different and a better way, a way that's shaped by Jesus and the power of the Spirit. So we're trying. To, what I tried to do there is to point to the way Christians have focused over 2,000 years to engage in difficult times. We're, you know, we shouldn't be surprised we're the first people to live in a divided time. You know, others have in the past, and how we might do that well, faithfully focused on the kingdom of God. It seems like so many people today in all walks and both sides of the aisle, especially, you know, in politics, everybody's feeling so anxious, yeah. and and that seems to create this sort of meanness, really, that's, that you see in social media. You have like family members breaking up oh, over sure. political yep. issues. And like, it's like, what does the gospel have to say to that? Yeah, and I think we see that throughout the scriptures. You know, things about, I mean, back in the book of Proverbs about harsh words and how we respond. And I think a lot of people need to ask the question, how would I honor Christ 
in the midst of some of this division. You know, we're not far away from the holiday season, right? You're going to face your family. You might disagree on some things politically. But in the midst of that, is that our primary loyalty? No, that should be to Christ and his kingdom. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to focus on in Christians in the Age of Outreach. Well, that's awesome. Are you guys ready to hear more? Yeah. Ed, thank you so much. Thank what an brother. honor. Thank you for coming all the way out to Chicago. And it's, it really is a big honor for us to have you today. And I know that, uh, that we here at the church and the millions watching on the Hour of Power are so excited to have you. Thank Let's you, my friend. Hand. Thank you, Ed. God bless Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, and it is great to be here with you. If you have a Bible, you can take it out and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it's, uh, we do live in a divided time. Increasingly, people are turning the volume up to 11 and being very uh, vocal and upset and angry and divisive. Outrage has sort of been the theme of our day. It's not just politics, but it certainly includes politics. It's sometimes in families, at workplaces, uh, with neighbors, and more. And from what I can see, you know, I used to run a research team for about 10 years. From what I can see, based on the trends, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And so we're actually, uh, it keeps getting louder and louder, but it looks like it's going to get even louder in days to come. Now, I'm not predicting the future. I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. I actually work at a nonprofit organization. So... <laughs> I'm not saying that I know for sure, but it seems like it. And, but we're not the first people to kind of live in a time that's a divided time and a divided season. We actually can look to the New Testament itself, 2 Corinthians. Paul is defending his apostleship to some degree. And in the midst of that, there's some truth that Paul gives in this kind of admonishment slash encouragement to the church at a place called Corinth. And here the church had been internally divided. There had been uh, some difficulty in the community and not dissimilar to maybe where we are today in some ways. And so the question is, is how do we live in the midst of these divided times? So I want to look at four things from this passage that I think will help us to respond well in the midst of the outrage and the fracturing around us. So would you want to, you want to kind of a walk through or break through the outrage in a fractured world? I think we need to represent Jesus and his kingdom well. That's both our title and our theme today is representing Jesus and his kingdom well. Four things. Number one is we get a new perspective. Let's look here at what the Bible says. It says this in verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. We look closely, it says from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view which is a reminder that now we look at people differently because of who we are in Christ. We kind of have a different look at the world. We have a different look at people. We know, for example, people are made in the image of God, worthy of dignity and respect because we have a different look because of this new life we have in Christ. So now, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Then it reminds us, even if we've known Christ from a worldly point of view, we no longer know him like that. In other words, maybe before, this is 2,000 years ago, maybe some of the people didn't know who Christ really was, and they had a very worldly view. Now they know him for who he is. He is God the Son. He is Jesus the Christ. He's the Savior of the world. So it ties in this new look. We know Christ differently. Now we've got a new look, maybe new lenses through which we see the world. But it doesn't end there. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there is new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. So don't miss that what's going on here is if they're tied in together. It says, therefore. Whenever there's a therefore in the Bible, you want to ask, what's it there for? Well, in this case, it's connecting the two verses, right? So we got this new look. Now, how do we get this new look? Well, because we have this new life. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, there's new creation. We've been made new in Christ. So now, because we've got a new life, we're going to have a new look, we're going to have new lenses through which we see the world. Part of it we might understand that the world's pretty broken. I mean, think about 1 Corinthians 7.31 actually says the world, the present form of this world, is passing away. So if the world's passing away, we ought not to be shocked or surprised that there's division and fracture and brokenness and outrage. We've got to ask, how do we live as Christians in the age of outrage, how do we bring our best when the world is at its worst? Now, when we think about the moment we're in, it kind of remind us in many ways of the mission we're on. How do we see things differently, right? Don't miss it, right? Got this new life in Christ, 
We've got this new look through which we see the world, maybe some new lenses through which we see these things. Now, let me explain a little more about uh, lenses. I have, I have three daughters. They're all, uh, well, they're, they're, they're 14, they're 16, and 20, and 20, which is both a statement of truth and a prayer request at the same time. Um, <laughs> love my daughters. Girls, girls are amazing. But they have so many words. But anyway, that's another story for another, <laughs> another day. Um, so, but my, my daughters are uh, wonderful and amazing. My youngest daughter uh, seems that she inherited her father's eyes. You may notice that I wear glasses. And so, um, so I, I wear glasses because I, I need to. And so it wasn't that long ago. Last year, she came home from the eye doctor. And we, uh, Donna, my wife, shared with me that Caitlin's going to have to get glasses. Okay. Well, so, so I, so I, I kind of wanted to comfort her. And so, because when I was a kid, wearing glasses was something that got you made fun of, right? They called me four eyes when I was a kid. I had these, and you know, to be fair, I had the big glasses and the eye patch. I mean, I had the whole deal. And so, but they made fun of me. And so I was a little concerned. I don't want Caitlin to be made fun of. So I said, honey, honey I'm sorry. And she said, what do you mean? You're sorry. Um, I said, well, you have to wear glasses. Yeah, that's cool now, she said. I said, she said, some kids in middle school, they're actually going to the eye place and buying glasses without prescriptions because they're that cool. And I thought to myself, I was born at the wrong time. <laughs> uh, deeply disappointed that when I was a kid, that was not cool. Uh, and it's so many things that now, like comic books. I read comic books as a kid because I was a nerd. Now they're blockbuster films and all the cool people do that. So something is tragically wrong with my birth year. But that's another story <laughs> for another day. But lenses we use. So I don't wear glasses, though, for fashion. I wear glasses for seeing. Uh, I want to see you when I talk to you. I want to see my, my wife, Donna. I want to see my girls. I want to see. But the reality is, is sometimes glasses sort of define us. And it, it's, it's interesting because it came up at the Moody Church where, um, where, where Bobby mentioned that I've been serving. So I've been the uh, interim teaching pastor there for uh, two years which is longer than two of their actual pastors were the pastor of that church. So it's been a long, <laughs> been a long interim. And a wonderful, though, it's a wonderful church there in Chicago, a historic, founded by uh, D.L. Moody, um, and a beautiful sanctuary, just a wonderful place. It's not the most comfortable seats. Warren Wearsby, one of the former pastors, used to say, come on in, grab a seat, any seat, they are all equally uncomfortable. <laughs> so if you've ever been to Moody Church, you've experienced that. But one of the things that when you're in this church, it's been around 150 years, that's very well known by its former pastors. The most recent pastor, Erwin Lutzer, has recently uh, stepped into a role as pastor emeritus while they're looking for uh, a new pastor. But, but it's kind of historic. So people listen on the radio. Actually, Pastor Lutzer is still the voice of Moody Church on the radio because I'm the interim. I'm not the radio. So people come every week to church and come up to me and thank me for the message they heard me do on the radio. So they actually think I'm Pastor Lutzer. But we sort of Lutzer, Stetzer, so I just go with it and I say, you're so welcome, I hope you enjoyed that. Shake their hands and all is good. Well, one of the things though, when you have so many people who've kind of cycled in and out of the church um, over the years, you have hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people who kind of have this stake in the church and they send letters, right? Sometimes they're wonderful letters, sometimes not so much, but they send letters and they'll express an idea or an opinion. And so I read some of them, particularly the signed ones, and uh, here's one that I, uh, that I recently received that I thought I'd share with you, relates to our topic. Here it is, I mean, this is unedited. I just took a screenshot on my phone. I edited out the, uh, the, the so the two paragraphs here are not edited, but I edited out the dear pastor and the, and the signature. He did sign it, here's what he said. He said, I listened to your August 13th sermon at Moody Church Online. After listening to it once, which I think that's a good sign, that means he listened more than once, I listened again. Okay, great. Because I was awestruck getting better with the number of times you adjusted your glasses while preaching. <laughs> so the second, it was not what I was going for with the awestruck. So the second time I listened, I saw in the first 36 minutes of your sermon, you adjusted your glasses 74 times. <laughs> and then you took them off. So I counted no further. And he goes, I guess, to get a calculator, because it says this was an average of once every 30 seconds. <laughs> but keep in mind, this was an incomplete count, because some of the time scripture or your sermon was on the screen, and I could not see you. 
I tell you this in Christian love. They all say that at some point in the letter. <laughs> because I know that you're interested in being aware of anything that may distract listeners from hearing what you are preaching, teaching. So I hope you will accept this knowing that I want your ministry for Christ to be as effective as possible. <laughs> now I believe this guy wants to help me. I actually made changes on the basis of this email. I bought a product called Nerd Wax. I put it on my glasses. It keeps them from sliding down. So I made changes, uh, but here's the reality. I don't wear glasses and I don't adjust them for fashion. I do these things for seeing. Now, I know some of you are already right now planning to count how many times I touch my glasses by the end of the message today. Let's just get that out of your heart right now. Focus on the message at hand. Because here's the thing. I want you not to miss, right? So I need glasses to see. I need lenses to see the world. But now in Christ, I've got this new life. It's given me a new look. I look and see people differently now. This new look involves some supernatural lenses. And here's the thing I don't want you to miss. They slip too. Because I adjust my glasses because they slide down my nose and the focal length gets off and I can't see. And so I, I put them back. But here's what I want you to miss, right? In the world in which we live, when it's so easy to get distracted and out of focus, we've got to adjust the lenses. That's why Paul even writes this. Why would Paul tell us this if it was automatically evident that we're already seeing the world, not in a worldly way, but through the lenses of our new life in Christ? Here's why. Because he's reminding us because they were not. And 2,000 years later, it's easy for us to see the world through the lenses of things other than our new life in Christ. Some people are being discipled by their cable news channel. Some people are being spiritually shaped by their social media feed. And the end result is they look just like everyone else in the world when Jesus calls us to a different and a better way. So why does that matter? Well, it matters because as Christians, we need to look through a new lens because we've received a new life that's given us a new look. And if you wanna step through the outrage and the fracturing in our world, you have to do so by representing Jesus and his kingdom well. So number one, we get a new perspective. Number two, sent on a mission of reconciliation. Let's continue to look at the text. It says, now everything is from God. It's referring to that which is before. Now everything is from God. All this is from God, right? It says, who, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Don't miss those two words in there. Reconciled us, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. It goes on and it says that is like in Christ, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. It's actually a double parallel. It kind of talks about how God reconciled us to himself, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Then there's a parallel of it, a repeat. It says reconciling the world to himself in Christ, committed to us the message of reconciliation. Don't you miss this, right? This is tied together, it begins with now all this is from God, so that which comes before, the new life, which gives us a new look, which gives us some new lenses through which to see the world, supernatural lenses that need adjusting because sometimes we get caught up in the world's ways, but here we are sent on a mission of reconciliation. You are sent, I am sent on a mission of reconciliation. That implies some things that really matter. It's, it implies for us that people without Christ need to be reconciled to God through Christ. And it tells us that we have been reconciled to God through Christ if we're followers of Jesus, right? We've been born again by the power of the gospel. We're living now new life in Christ. Not perfect, lenses need adjusting regularly, but we have been reconciled to God and now we're sent as agents of reconciliation in the world. So your job and my job then is to be in the midst of a broken and fractured and outraged world, but to represent reconciliation in the name of Jesus. Now that reconciliation will be uh, men and women to God. It also means we'll minister his kingdom and perhaps bring some reconciliation in the midst of the outrage and the brokenness that is all around us as well. You know, I, I just have the privilege of holding the Billy Graham chair at Wheaton College. I serve the executive director of the Billy Graham Center. And of course this year, uh, uh, Mr. Graham went on to be uh, with the Lord. And of course, you know that Mr. Graham had a connection here as well. The, the, the words, hour of power, are actually suggested first by Mr. Graham and then named this program many, many years ago. 
But, but Mr. Graham went on to be with the Lord, and in doing so, it's, it kind of changed a lot of our conversation for just a little while. In our country, people looked at him and said, this was a guy who represented Jesus and his kingdom well, a winsome voice for the gospel. Well, but why? Because he saw himself as, a, as an agent of reconciliation. Um, when he died, um, we, I was asked within just a little bit of time to write articles for both the USA Today and CNN, and I did, and I asked them, how, how overt can I be about his message? And they said, be all in. One of the articles was called, What Billy Graham Would Want You to Know About Him. And one of the things was, is Billy Graham was famous. That's not what he would want you to know. Billy Graham certainly was famous. He's uh, one of the most well-known figures ever. Matter of fact, he will probably be the, as of now, he's the person most named as the most admired person in America. Uh, probably no one will ever beat that record because how many times he was on there and how much our country is divided now. But he's certainly uh, deeply admired. But ultimately, he saw himself as reconciled to God and being an agent of reconciliation. I remember I was in Florida when I heard the news that he had gone on to uh, be with the Lord. And the day before, Donna, my wife, and I went down. I was speaking at an event in Florida. And uh, when you live in Chicago and it's uh, cold, Donna always wants to go with me when it's an event in Florida. So we went together. We got into, uh, when we got into our car, and when we got into our car, we take, we're taking Uber. And the Uber driver, Uber drivers tend to be very nice because they're trying to earn that magical five rating. Uh, I'm trying to earn the Magical 5 rating in return, so I'm being nice to them as well. Very important, my Uber rating. And so I get in the car, and Jane starts talking to Donna and me. She says, like, sometimes Uber drivers will build this. I got a bottle of water if you'd like it. If you need to charge your phone, I got an adapter. Take anything you'd like in the middle. And one of the things in the middle was a little green. Well, I'm not sure it was green. I don't remember now, but I'm remembering like a Gideon Bible. And so Donna kind of smiled at me because it's, I've never gotten an Uber where one of the options was a Bible. And so um, we started driving to the airport, and Jane started having a conversation with us and moving that conversation towards spiritual things. Donna keeps looking over at me, smiling. You know, Jane's like, well, how long you lived here? Well, a couple of years, and she asks five or six different questions, and she gets closer and closer to asking kind of spiritual questions. So tell me, and I don't remember her exact words, but I mean, tell me, do you have any, like, church engagement or involvement? She's about to kind of land the plane and share the gospel with me, and Donna's smiling because I'm not saying anything much, and... And Donna, at one point, she says that, she turns to me and says, you need to tell her. And I said, Jane, just so you know, I'm actually, I, I, I hold the Billy Graham chair at Wheaton College, I teach evangelism, and you are doing great. <laughs> and she laughed, and we laughed, and actually recorded her, an interview with her that I later published in Christianity Today, uh, called Jane the Uber Driver. Jane the Uber Driver. <laughs> um, you can find that quite easily, it got picked up by a lot of different outlets, but so fast, fast forward, we hear that Mr. Graham has passed, and oh, I don't even know, it was a little while later, we were in Charlotte for the funeral, and, and uh, you know, the, the world gathered, right? Uh, he, Mr. Graham lied, uh, was, was in the Capitol Rotunda, uh, which the last person who had that honor was actually Rosa Parks. Um, presidents went to visit him there, pre and, and funeral as well. And so while at the funeral, though, all the reporters were there. So a reporter from a national newspaper, you know the name, came up to me and said, uh, Dr. Stetzer, who is the next Billy Graham? And you know, people wonder, and people, you know, is it so-and-so? And nobody really claims that. Nobody says, I'm the next Billy Graham. There's organizational leaders. There's, there's people that other people say are the next Billy Graham. But nobody, to my knowledge, actually says, I'm the next Billy Graham. But I was ready. She said, uh, the reporter said, who's the next Billy Graham? And I said, Jane the Uber driver is. <laughs> and she looked at me with a puzzled look, and I kind of explained. It didn't make the story, but... Uh, but here's the thing I don't want you to miss, right? Jane knew that she's been sent on a mission of reconciliation. She was, because of the joy of being reconciled with Christ, she's actually a realtor. She works in and around the community where we live. And her, her kid said, you should go drive Uber when you don't have a, a house to show. You'd like that. You like to talk to people. And she said, and I get to share the gospel with them. And so Jane drives around picking up people so she can tell them about Jesus. And here's the reality I don't want you to miss. She knows she's sent on a mission of reconciliation, but so are you if you're a follower of Jesus. We've been reconciled and sent on a mission of reconciliation. So number one, we get a new perspective, new life, new look, new lenses. Number two, we're sent on a mission of reconciliation. Number three, representing Jesus and his kingdom. Let's look at verse 20. It says, we are ambassadors, we are therefore ambassadors, we're Christ's ambassadors, right? As though God were making his appeal through us, 
we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So this passage here is, speaks really, Paul's actually speaking about himself and the kind of band of missionaries that are with him. He's defending his apostleship, but for 2,000 years, Christians have applied this to themselves. I think it's appropriate to do so because we are ambassadors for Christ. Why? Because that's our primary focus, right? Our primary focus is not a politician or a party or an elected official. We're, we're, the only person we should be all in for is Jesus, and the only kingdom that should be our greatest priority is his kingdom. And can I tell you, when that's the truth, it shapes how you respond to other people. Remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 6, 33. He said, seek first, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. When Christians are primarily focused on the values and the importance of the kingdom of God, it changes everything about how they relate to others. You say, Ed, I just think I should be able to say whatever I want. I, it's a free country. I can say whatever I want. And I can put it on social media or we're coming up on the holidays. I can say it at Thanksgiving dinner. I can say it at Christmas, whatever I want. I'm just being frank. Can I tell you, unless your name's Frank, stop. <laughs> and Frank, be Christ-like as well. Because it's not driven by your rights. It's driven by Jesus' kingdom. Now, part of that is to live in a world where there are rights that do matter, and we can and should speak up, but the question is, what are you representing? Because we're ambassadors for Christ. Are we representing Jesus? That's not always easy. We don't get to pick the time in which we live, and this turns out to be a divided time. Not the most divided time ever. Gosh, we can look at the history of our country or countries around the world. Even today, there's much more division around the world than there might be here, but there's division here. And the question is, will we add to it or will we represent Jesus in the midst of it? Again, the question is, will we add to it or will we represent Jesus in the midst of it? It's not always easy. There's only two times in our English Bible the word ambassador is used. Once here in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul uses it elsewhere in Ephesians 6, where he says, pray for me. He asks for prayer. He says, pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. And we see that around the world, sometimes poignantly. Recently, uh, Wheaton College graduate Andrew Brunson, who was a missionary to Turkey, was falsely imprisoned and, and, and not long ago released and, and immediately just began talking about Jesus as he had been when he was unjustly imprisoned in a Turkish prison for two years. Why? Because he's an ambassador for Christ. And we represent Christ and his kingdom, we represent Jesus and his kingdom in the midst of the brokenness all around us. Now, number four, and finally, and I'll close with this. You know what it means when a guest speaker says, I'll close with this? Absolutely nothing, <laughs> just so you know, but I will. Number one, we get a new perspective. Number two, sent on a mission of reconciliation. Number three, representing Jesus and his kingdom. Number four, because of the cross. Now it's interesting because it almost seems like Paul stepped away for a moment and came back with a new thought. Here's what it says. God made him who had no sin. Let's look at that closely so you don't miss it. God made him who had no sin. That's God made Jesus, him who had no sin. God made Jesus to be sin for us so that in him, don't miss those in hymns, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, this verse is very theological. It's actually a theological principle at work here called imputation. I want you to say that word out loud with me. Are you ready? Imputation. Let's do it again. Imputation. Now, I'm going to explain it because I believe if you can learn to order coffee at Starbucks, you can learn some theological words at church. I don't know a venti latte from an imputation, but I'll explain what imputation is. My wife goes to Starbucks. I just buy coffee for her because I don't drink it. But the, the imputation is, it's from the first century, it's a banking term, it's like a deposit, right? And so here's the thing, we were born, right? We were born and we inherited a sin nature. It was imputed to us, so we were sinners by nature and by choice, but that didn't end there. Thank God the story didn't end there. You see, on the cross, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. On the cross, Jesus, remember when he cries out, Eloi, Eloi, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Remember when he sweat blood in the garden, why? Because on the cross, he knew he wasn't just dying, he was dying, not just dying for our sin, but literally, he was made sin for us. 
So when Jesus died on the cross for our sin and in our place, he took my place, he took the penalty for my sin, and in the process of doing so, my sin as a Christian was imputed to Jesus, deposited in him. But that's not the end of the verse. Here's where it gets even great, right? It goes on and says this. It says, right, it lays this out for us. It says, so that we might become, don't miss the second part of it, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's one more imputation. His righteousness has now been imputed to us. So if you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus, the God the Father doesn't look down and see your sin. He sees Jesus' righteousness, and he sees the forgiveness and the grace. He sees the righteousness of his Son because his righteousness has been imputed to you if you're a follower of Jesus. Now that has all kinds of implications. If you're not a follower of Jesus today, you can trust and follow him. Receive that forgiveness of sin, be changed, and then become this kind of person who's, who gets a new perspective, sent on a mission of reconciliation, representing Jesus and his kingdom because of the cross. But the question is here, why is this at the end of this passage? Because it's such a different feel to it. Here, but here's why. It is the motivation for everything that precedes it. See why? Because he made the one who knew no sin to be sin for us. So Jesus died a sinner's death. He wasn't a sinner, but he died a sinner's death so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in him. And now as I get to walk in the fullness of the forgiveness and the grace and the righteousness and the beauty of the gospel and the filling of the spirit, now I can, not just I can, I should and must live differently. To acknowledge I've got a new life that's given me a new look, some new lenses through which I see the world. That means I'm going to engage differently because I'm representing Jesus and his kingdom now. Right? So I'm on a mission of reconciliation because I've been reconciled. I'm sharing that with others, the good news of the gospel, and I'm bringing reconciliation to a divided world so that I can be an ambassador in the midst of it. And the end result is I do this to honor Christ because of the cross. So sisters and brothers, my encouragement to you is simple. Put on, put on those supernatural glasses when you engage your neighbors or your friends or your family or on social media. Work towards reconciliation with God and with others. Seek to represent Jesus and his kingdom and do so because of what Christ has done for you on the cross. Would you pray with me? Father, by your grace, and your goodness, you have redeemed us and called us by name. You've sent us on a mission in the midst of brokenness and outrage. Father, help us to be Christians in the age of outrage who bring our best when the world is at its worst. Help us not to justify engaging in worldly means to actually receive some sort of spiritual benefit, Lord, but let our hearts and our lives be shaped by the gospel, be instructed by the word of God, be empowered by the spirit, so that the way we live might not burn bridges with our neighbors and people with whom we disagree, but might build them. And ultimately your name and your fame would be more widely known. For it's in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen and amen. Thanks for the opportunity to share with you. God bless. <laughs>
especially if you want to influence people with your ideas. This is a great book for that and a great time to be agents of reconciliation, not creating greater divides, but greater peace with one another. Amen? We need more of that. Hey, you are so loved, and way to go. You went to church today. Make sure today you rest, relax, connect deeply with your friends and family, eat good food, take a nap, do the stuff you love to do. It's, it's a day to recharge and go into the workday tomorrow full of life. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.